Thank you very much. Um, my presentation today is entitled Putting a Big Tan into Tennis. The whole idea behind the presentation is to show 10 things that I think can make tennis a more healthy sport. What is a healthy sport? Well, for me, a healthy sport is many people of all ages and levels play the sport. Because they play the sport and have fun, they want to improve and buy things that help them get better, like coaching, equipment, club memberships. And because they play, they want to watch the best players play live and on television. And of course, because participation is high with a large number of young people playing and watching, the sport attracts very good TV coverage and sponsorship. We need to adapt. Why? Because today in many developed tennis nations, we're seeing declining participation and the average age of the tennis spectator is over 50. We need to adapt the sports to the needs and lifestyles of the customer and the customers, the current players and potential players because lifestyles have changed, people have less time and we need to position the sport in a different way. So what I've come up with are 10, I think, innovative ways that I think can make the sport better in the areas of professional tennis, international junior tennis, I think things that the ITF could do differently, including Davis Cup and Fed Cup, how to increase participation, and the area that I think is very sensitive but very important, which is the ranking system and the working together for the good of the game of the top seven organizations in tennis. So fast, back and relax, and I hope you enjoy the flight. My first idea is to introduce a cut at the professional events. In the same way as golf, we would introduce a cut. And what I see is the last two days of any professional tennis event, there's actually very little activity and not many matches to watch, actually only two matches usually. You don't know who'll be playing on, on the Sunday, on the last day until the Saturday. And therefore it's very hard for the sponsors to activate around players. If we introduce a cut where all of the players reaching quarterfinals stay for the last three days, we can have playoff for the places, different points and prize money. And on the last day, there are four singles players and eight players around being activated with the sponsors. And the sponsors know on Thursday who will be playing on Saturday and Sunday. And remembering golf, even if Tiger Woods is not winning the tournament, young kids get to follow him on the last two days because he might be in 30th or 40th position, but they get to see him. And that can be the same with Federer because if he reaches quarterfinals, you still get to see him on the Sunday, even if it is a fifth and sixth place match. Also, although it's very sensitive, they like to do what they want, but the Grand Slams could play a match for third place. A bronze medal at a Grand Slam could be a very powerful thing with maybe the women playing uh, their third and fourth before the men's final and the men playing before the women's final. Second innovation would be to change the system for entry-level professional tennis. One of my uh, things I think is a big objective for me would be to try, and I think for tennis should be, is to try to make sure the top 700 players can break even. So how can we do that? Well, <clears throat> I think we need to allow a lot of access for players to get into the system. So I like the idea at the entry level, 15,000 and 25,000, having big qualifying and 32 draw events. But the players don't make enough money to be able to break even, even the very good ones. But if you made prize money only for quarterfinals and onwards for the singles and runner up and winner for the doubles, you'll double the prize money for the best players playing 15K and 25K events, which means a player making at the moment 18,000 is going to make 36,000 which allows them to break even. So the good players will make money, but the not so good players will have access to the system. I also think if you introduce regional circuits, you can reduce expenses with less travel and that's what golf does. So you would have Asia Pacific, Euro Africa, Pan American circuits with maybe the best a chance to play in the bigger tournaments. In golf, look what happens. Uh, it's also linked to the ranking because only the PGA and, and the European Tour, they, I'm sorry, the RNA share the, the ranking 
uh, responsibilities, but they have regional circuits and these generate a lot of money. There's a South African tour, there's an Asian tour. There's also a challenger tour. You can see a screenshot, which provides very good prize money for players ranked around 400, 500, 600. As a result of this, 500 or more players are making a good living in the men's game and a lot more and quite a lot in the women and only 130 players make a good living in men's and women's tennis. It's not acceptable. The third innovation I would want to see is to encourage, we need to encourage more top players to play doubles. Um, I have to say the top female players off, usually play doubles at the top events, but the men generally don't. And we have the ludicrous situation where the US Open final of the doubles, about 3,000 spectators are watching the final in a 25,000 seater stadium. It's not good enough. An interesting uh, uh, um, information is that the last player who in their career won singles and doubles grand slams in their career, male player, was Kafelnikov in 1993. He won two Grand Slam in singles and, and was capable of winning doubles. Nobody has done it since then for nearly over 18 years. So what are the solutions? My innovations would be start the doubles at Grand Slams on the second Monday. So the players losing first three rounds of singles can sign in on the Sunday. This will be great for the tournament because in the second week, there's not so much going on and you have great matches going on second week. You might have to play the juniors in the first week, but that's, that's possible. The other thing would be to introduce an end of year bonus for the best three combined ranked players. So a big bonus for players who end up in the top three combined singles and doubles. But probably the best would be what I did in juniors uh, in 2004 is introduce a combined ranking, counting maybe not 75%, but maybe 85, 90% singles and 10 to 15% doubles for the ranking. My fourth innovation will be to try to make international junior tennis more user-friendly. User-friendly for whom? For the players, for the parents, for the coaches. No other sport travels as much as tennis. We have juniors, and we all know, traveling 20-plus weeks from the age of 12 on the Tennis Europe circuit. Uh, we also know from player development that players 13, 14, from then on, need to try to play 80 or more matches per year on different surfaces against different opponents with a two to one win loss ratio. And the current system makes it very difficult for the coaches to organize and for the parents to pay, et cetera. For example, if you play 15 tournaments in the international circuit, Tennis Europe, COSAT, uh, or in the ITF circuit, the player might play 15 singles or 75 singles, you don't know. So often, instead of playing 20 weeks of tournaments, players are playing 30 weeks of tournament and it impacts on their education. Also, if players lose in the first or second round, they can't return. Their airfares are set on a certain date. They have to pay for hotels, so it's more expensive. So my innovation would be to create a new system for ITF grade three, uh, five, four, or three, and also for regional circuits, 14s and 16s, which would use the placement system where every player is guaranteed five singles, but serious singles, because we would have different points for each place for third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, all the way down to 32nd. We'd have to charge a higher entry fee, but that's okay because coaches and federations would be prepared to pay a higher entry fee instead of maybe $50, you're gonna pay 150. The referees will have to work harder because you have the same number of matches each day. The club has to give up all their courts for the whole week, but it's better system for the customers, the players, and that's what it's all about. And because now the player can say 20 weeks will give me a hundred matches. Now they have 30 weeks to focus on their education. Um, my fifth innovation would be, again, one of the things I felt very strongly about in my presidential campaign for the ITF is that the ITF should be strong and leading. And I think like many international federations in sport, they should hold a world championship every two years. It should be a 64 or a 96 straw event played in different regions each time in non-Olympic year with big prize money and preferably points agreed with ATP WTA. This would be a major event 
where you could give wild cards for regional representation. And it would also generate income for the ITF, which could then be shared in the lower level of the game in juniors and other development aspects. Second thing is, I believe that Davis Cup is not working. And I think Davis Cup and Billie Jean King should be played at the top level over two years. In the first year, you would have three weeks on the calendar where 32 teams play in eight groups of four. And you'd get three matches a year in that year, one at home, two away, or two at home, one away. And um, the top team would qualify for the quarterfinals the next year. The advantage of this system is that in September, you know the following year that the matches are going to be at a certain date and a certain venue, and you can promote the event. So there's a match in February, there's one in July, there's one in September, and you can promote the event. The second year, you have quarterfinals, semifinals, and finals. The home and away system, which I believe will allow more promotion of top tennis in more countries and the greater economic impact in the host cities. I know my, my friend and colleague, Fernando Segal will understand that in Argentina now with the new system, they cannot have a home match because they're automatically into the world group. And so they can't promote tennis like they used to do. And also the economic impact when they used to have a home match, they would have thousands of su supporters coming into the city from other countries, having hotels. And it was a great event. Young people seeing their stars like Del Patro playing. Now it's not happen happening. So that for me would be very good for also Billie Jean King Cup. And it would really mean something to win the Davis Cup or Billie Jean King Cup every two years. My sixth innovation, which is currently happening, but I think we need to focus more on it, is the user-friendly playing competition to drive tennis. Now, let me, for me, the best part of tennis is hitting it over, hitting it back, and playing the point. Serve, rally, score. That should drive the sport. Coaching should support. Tennis coaching is not a sport. My friend Mike Barrell always says that. Playing the game with scoring is the sport. So coaching should support, not drive. We need a lot of different formats and scoring, and the needs and lifestyles of the players have to be considered. Less time etc. More choice. There's another person speaking at this conference who will talk about 30-30 tennis. <clears throat> Again, it's a very good innovation that you can play a set in 10 minutes with this format. And so people without much time, this could be a very good format for the future. Now, when I talk about play and tennis competition, tennis play and tennis competition, I want to differentiate between the two because both involve keeping score but for me, tennis play is where you keep score, but nobody records the result. And a lot of people like that. It's nice to play, you keep score, you play matches, nice format, but it's less pressure. And it also play, the word play is very like fun. Tennis competition is more serious. It's when two people play and you record the result. And some people like that. So we need this combination of play and tennis competition. but the key thing is at the micro level, we need to have more people responsible for organizing play and competition for the recreational players. What I see happening around the world is when I go into a club, I see a lot of information about coaching. I see a lot of full-time people working in coaching, but I don't see many people responsible for organizing the play, especially of the recreational players. They organize it for the advanced players, but not for the recreational players. Finally, I think this green ball, which is 25% slower, is allowed to be used for all levels of play. It's in the rules. But I don't think enough clubs are using it for recreational players, and it'll help them to have more fun, more rallies, get a better workout. And so, as we say in Ireland many times, the obvious is often the greatest secret. And I believe it's obvious that the green ball should be used more, but people often don't see it. The seventh innovation would be that throughout the world, tennis is introduced in an active and dynamic way. The first experience is active and dynamic for all players. Now, I believe that's happening pretty well in, junior, in, in young kids' tennis, and that's because of the 
Bain State campaign, the Tennis Tens program, that now pretty much every kid around the world, they're playing usually their first tennis with a red ball or even with a balloon, and they're learning tennis in a more active way. It used to be we taught tennis in a way like you do boring, boring stuff for a year and eventually you get to play the game. Well, people have less attention span. We need to get them playing and active in the first session. So the, the juniors is good, but the, and, and also this, the balls have allowed us to use the game-based approach much more, which in simple terms is that people play the game, hit it over, hit it back, play the point. It's active and dynamic. They're moving around. And then the coach looks at each player and gives relevant instruction. It will be technical, tactical, physical, or mental to help the players play better in the game. And so, for example, it might be for one player, hit the ball a little bit more in front, technical, recover your position, more tactical, or it might be, look, get in position earlier. It might be a movement thing or just to concentrate. So this is relevant instruction, but to help players play better, not just to look cosmetically better. Now, adults, this is where I see the problem, is that we're not introducing tennis in an active and dynamic way enough. Now, we've got to understand something, that one of the unique positives about our sport is a lot of people come to our sport when they're over 40. They finish playing their active sport like basketball, soccer, netball, volleyball, they come to tennis. Now, the thing we have to realize is when they come to tennis, they're going to compare this new sport tennis with the sport that they're coming from. And if they're coming from a sport where they've been running around and playing, and we put them in the first session in a situation where they don't hit the ball, they're just doing shadow swings, or they're just doing static hitting with the coach feeding, it's not good enough. So I think that's why we need and Tennis Express was a very good project we introduced at the ITF, is using the orange and green ball, make sure that the adults in the first lesson are playing with each other. Sure, the technique may not be so good, but they're playing and rallying and moving and build, getting a sweat, and gradually then you can help them with the game base to give them the instruction, the relevant instruction, so that they can play better. But the bottom line is we want our sport to grow active and dynamic uh, introduction. Let me give you a dangerous st statistic is that in the US many years ago, 2007, I think it was, they did a thing called the Welcome Centers. They got a huge number of people to come for the Welcome Center program, but actually only 7% stayed on in tennis. Why? Because they weren't using the slower balls and the experience was very boring and very not very interesting for them. And they lost a lot of people, whereas in Denmark, when they did a similar program, introducing a lot of people, using the ball, Tennis Express, the sign up afterwards to the clubs was over 60%. The next point, <clears throat> innovation, which is happening now with UTR and the World Tennis Rating, is we need a world rating system for tennis. It's something I believed in for, many, for a long time, and people may forget because... Uh, Back in 2000, there was a, a, a big conference involving all the big, the big groups in tennis, including the slams and the ATP and WTA. And from that was decided to, to try to develop an international rating. And I set up a task force with six very good people from the big nations. And we eventually developed the ITN, which was launched in 2003, the international number. After that, because it was before broadband, we never invested in the analytics Maybe it was an idea before its time, but along came then UTR who used analytics for their rating system. There was 10 cap and now ITF is developing the world tennis number. Now for me, I, I hope one of them is gonna be really successful. I think the ITF's one will be successful because the nations will support it, but we need an accurate world rating system. Why? It'll help players to find partners at the same level to play with. Every game counts, so it means lots of formats and user-friendly formats can be used. The recreational players will be more motivated to improve and to buy things to help them improve. i am always use this example that why does a very poor recreational golfer pay $1,000 for a putter? They do that 
because they want to beat their friends in a club uh, match the next week. It's not an important match. It's a recreational match, but they spend money because they want to get better because there's a handicap system which gives people um, status if they have a, a better handicap. So the last thing, which a lot of people don't see about the rating is that finally coaches will be accountable because if a player takes 10 lessons from a coach, private lessons, and their world tennis rating is still the same or worse, they should get their money back. So coaches will have to focus on actually giving instruction to help the player play better. Now, I know sometimes players have to go back to go forward, but over a period of time, um, people should be able to see improvement through the world tennis number. <clears throat> Next point is I think tennis needs a player union at the top level. Now, it's quite topical now because uh, Djokovic and uh, Popsidil are very uh, activated in this area. But I felt this for a long time, and I've written about it for many years. You cannot run a tour employing players and also represent them as a union. You cannot be an employer in a union. It doesn't happen in any business. And so... I believe that the players should have a union which negotiates with each of the each of the organizations independently. So the slams for conditions with the ITF for Davis Cup and Billie Jean King Cup and Olympics and with the tours for their circuits and their tournaments. And that's why I think the PTPA, although it gets a lot of criticism, I think is would be a, a good thing for tennis. And also, I think that union could also look after the interests of the lower ranked players who currently are not being well represented. And I see in Kazakhstan, where I'm working, we have a player ranked 180 in the men who made $80,000 in prize money last year and is losing probably $100,000 a year on the tour. And a girl, 300, who made 18,000 last year. That's not acceptable. These people have put a lot of time into their development and it seems like in tennis that everybody's making money the big seven have about 2,500 employees um, the officiating have 1,500 full-time international officials they're making money coaches on the tour are making money but only 130 men and women are making a living okay so I come back to the to the final uh, innovation you know when we say innovation it, it may not seem like it, but I think it's certainly not happened for a long time. The big seven, the ITF, the four slams, the ATP and WTA need to work together for the good of the game. At the moment, they, they work against each other. And the, one of the best examples is that tennis was probably the only sport at the Olympics that didn't count the sport for international ranking. Even golf counted it. And it was only because the ATP and WTA wouldn't give points to the ITF for the Olympics. That's not acceptable. That's not good for the game. And as a result, it didn't get as good an entry as it should and didn't position the sport in front of Olympics as it should. So for me, I think the big seven need to get together. I think they are at the moment. There's some discussions going on a little bit. But what they need to do is to agree some top-line objectives to work on that are good for the sport in four years. Some examples, top 300 men and women should make a good living. Does everybody agree? Okay, good thing. The top 300 to 700 can break even. Can we agree? Top single players to play more doubles. We agree, let's work on it. Top players to promote the game, not just their sponsored products. We should have big professional events in every region of the world, not just in Europe, North America, and Asia. We need to position the sport in front of governments, IOC, as a model sport for life, men and women equal, healthy, clean from doping, a sport for life. Let's agree some top line objectives. We don't know how we're going to do it. We have smart people in all the organizations, but if we agree, let's try to work on it. When I ran for president, I tried to promote this and other tennis objectives. Together for tennis, ITF strong. I do believe the ITF should be leading for the good of the game because they also not just deal with professional tennis, but also with a lot of the other developmental aspects of the game. 
<clears throat> but unfortunately it wasn't successful, but I'll keep chipping away. Now, within this working together, one thing I feel very strongly about is the professional rankings. I believe that the professional rankings should be jointly owned and managed by all the seven together with some player representation. So the HB and WTA should not control the ranking. It's not good for the sport. It's not correct that Davis Cup, which has been in existence for over 100 years, doesn't get points and the ATP Cup gets points. How is that correct? It's not correct. So if the whole group, they can then decide which events get points, for example, regional circuits, all the people out there know that the futures, that the 15Ks and 25 don't get enough points. Everybody knows. But because it's an ITF circuit, the HBWJ don't give enough points to it. We could then support regional tours with points as golf does and increase the prize money around the world. But if the tourists don't agree to join, then I believe the ITF and the slams with the nations that hold big tournaments that own them, <clears throat> Monte Carlo, Bercy, et cetera, they should do their own ranking, but also count ATP and WTA events because it's good for the game. Okay, so my conclusions, these are 10 things. Um, I hope people see some merit in those things. Again, all put forward in order to make the game sport a more healthy sport. My conclusion is tennis is very conservative and really conservative, conservative and is very reluctant to innovate. And that's why this conference is very, very important that we're trying to get together people who actually think outside the box. Too many people who are in paid positions in the big organizations, unfortunately, are happy to maintain the status quo because they're okay. <clears throat> I'm proud that I was a person in my position at the ITF that I think brought about positive change in my area. It wasn't professional tennis, but we introduced a world rating system for tennis in 2003. We made a combined ranking for junior tennis in 2005, a play and stay campaign in 2007 to market the sport, a rule change, only the fifth rule change in the history of tennis in 2010 for 10 and under, Tennis Express, an active dynamic introduction for sport introduced in 2012. We've done a lot in that area of development and recreational tennis and junior tennis, but now I believe it's time for positive innovation and change in other areas of the game, especially professional tennis. Tradition is important. I believe in that, but tennis needs to be more open to change. The big seven have to be ready to work together for the good of the game. And probably the most important message is we need to innovate and adapt the sport to the needs and lifestyles of the customer to make tennis a healthy sport. More people playing, more people watching, more people buying tennis products. That's a healthy sport. Thank you very much.